What's up guys, Nundu here and now I'm back bringing uh, the final instalment. We finally here, we've got through all the previous WrestleManias and here we are now at the end. WrestleMania 29, this took place on April 7th, 2013 from the MetLife Stadium in Rutherford, New Jersey. Drawing a pay-per-view barrier of 1,048,000 buys, so not as good as last year but still a great number. Uh, this was headlined by Twice in a Lifetime. WWE Champion The Rock vs John Cena and looking back if we reflect on this a year later was this a bad Wrestlemania? No. Was it a good Wrestlemania? Not really. So I would say it's not one of the good Wrestlemania's, it's not one of the bad Wrestlemania's. I would say definitely one of those Wrestlemania in the middle type things so it wasn't a, or it wasn't a bad Wrestlemania but it wasn't exactly a good Wrestlemania. It's not like we're going to sit here in five, ten years time and go, oh god, did you remember how awesome WrestleMania 29 was? Because it wasn't one of those shows. Uh, so yeah, it's got a lot of negative reviews in the IWC, YWC at the time. I can understand that because I do think the build up of this show just wasn't very good. There was definitely a sense of, there was no like, no matches in the building up, no matches that I felt like I had to see at all. I mean, obviously I ordered it because it's Wrestlemania and because uh, obviously as a wrestling fan I order Wrestlemania every single year. I haven't, haven't missed a Wrestlemania in, since 1993 so and obviously so the thing is like no matter how bad the Wrestlemania looks like it's going to be I'll always order it and watch it because as a wrestling fan that's what I do. I can only imagine like similar situation to supporting your sports team no matter what happens. I think WrestleMania is like that with me, so yeah, just let's just get onto the card. We kick off a six man tag team action. The Shield versus Randy Orton, Sheamus in the big show. Of course the Shield came in Survivor Series 2012 and definitely one of the best new acts WWE's done in the last four, five, six years, whatever. I mean, they got over strong quite quickly. They did very well for themselves. No complaints about what they did it here. I mean, do it the way over the last few years. It seems like has done a fairly poor job of building up newcomers. They they build guys up, and then they knock them down. But the Shields won the few acts that WWE's always made look strong. And I mean, we're looking at it now. The a match. By the time I've recorded this, a Shield match hasn't been announced for WrestleMania. 30, but it looks as though they break it up. We're probably going to do a triple threat match. But like I say, this is what way? It's about what, what's, what's the date now? It's March. The, it's March the thirteenth now that I'm recording this. So because I've, I've recorded most of these videos well in advance to give myself most time possible. So a match between the two hasn't been announced yet. So it's basically the shield has just been destroying everybody on the roster. Uh, ended up. Sheamus have been through them quite a bit. I mean, this was originally announced as Orton, Sheamus, and Ryback, but then they switched it around and put Ryback with Mark Henry. So Orton and Sheamus were the faces. He got the Big Show to team with Big Show was a heel at the time. Uh, so the Big Show started a team with then, so it was like for a established WWE superstars in Orton, Sheamus, and the Big Show against the Shield. And I thought that Shield entering through the massive crowd was a great entrance, to be fair. And I thought this was, a, yeah, this was definitely a good WrestleMania opener. I mean, I've seen The Shield have far better matches than this. So this is probably, this wasn't amongst the best Shield matches out there. But it's still pretty good. There are no complaints at all. All three, all the Shield members looked out and impressed. Orton, James and Big Show did a decent job. This revolved around Big Show, whether he would um, work together with his partners or not. Big Show ended up walking out the match in there. The Shield ended up getting a nice, strong WrestleMania victory. So this was, I think the Shield were pretty much the only young guys at this show elevated way. Apart from where they try to elevate someone else in the show, but it hasn't ultimately hasn't worked out in the end. But I'll get to that one. So yeah, Shield beat I am Orton, Big Show, and Sheamus. Second match tonight we got Mark Henry versus Ryback, and this match was awful. I remember the time saying this match had the potential to go one or two ways. It could have been a surprisingly exciting big man match or it could have been an absolute awful match and unfortunately it ended up being an absolute awful match so 
It's amazing to think about one year ago, Ryback was pretty over as a face. I mean, Ryback came in just after WrestleMania 28, got a monster push right off the bat, built him up as the next Goldberg tight witch, let the smart ass fans chant Goldberg at him over and over again. You gotta love the, the wrestling now. I mean, some of the crowds are smart ass bastards these days. Uh, and then after Cena got injured, Ryback ended up getting himself a WWE Championship match with CM Punk at the Hell in a Cell pay per view. But then Ryback lost that match, which, alright, they had him lose, but they, they, they can still build him up as a monster because he got screwed. But then Ryback ended up losing. He lost a Survivor Series, TLC, uh, eliminated Royal Rumble, lost an Elimination Chamber. So that in the build up, this has four pay per view matches in a row. Now, Mark Henry had come back from injury loaf after Royal Rumble 2013. Got the big monster strong push again. So this was basically a feud around two big bastards who wanted to tear each other's heads off. They were having a contest to see who was stronger. They were having a weightlifting contest on SmackDown where Mark Henry beat down Ryback. So, and to be fair, Ryback, I swear, it might not be hard to believe now, but Ryback was actually really over he got a lot, he got good pops when he came out, he got the Feed Me More chance, so... Although he's, he was losing some momentum, it was fuck. <clears throat> if he got a strong victory or hate over Mark Henry, then... Possibly he can go for a push towards the WWE Championship. So we get the match, and, oh, this is a bad match, you know, it's just a really bad match. These two guys just didn't click, had a pretty boring match. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, just... They looked like something out of like 1988 or something like that. It would have fit in that era. And then, impossibly, oh, the worst finish he could have come up with. Mark Henry, oh, Ryback goes for shell shock. But then Mark Henry falls on top of Ryback. And Ryback's beaten again by 40 year old Mark Henry's like, oh, for f really? That was just the wrong way to go. I don't know what the fuck's that. I don't know what's going on there, just ignore that. Right, sorry about that, my microphone's going weird. So, sorry that I saw Henry Pete's Ryback in the year. Ugh. I thought that was the worst finish you could have come up with. Ryback looked so bad in there. I mean, Ryback lost so much momentum by not winning this match. They, they tried, then after the match, Ryback hit the shell shock anyway on Mark Henry, so... Why the fuck didn't Ryback just beat Mark Henry? But the next night in a row, they turned Ryback heel, and I don't know, it's, just, it's been a bad year for Ryback since then. It's been one setback after another, and right now, 2014, Ryback's just not over anymore. And I don't think he ever will be again. I mean, they've tried doing different things with him. The scene of few just didn't work out. They tried doing the bully Ryback gimmick, which is alright. Then they had him as a Paul Heyman guy, and that didn't really get over either. And now he's in a like, normal mid-card tag team with Curse Axel, and that's really going nowhere either, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Now, next up for the tag team titles, Team Hell No, Kane and Daniel Bryan, facing Dolph Ziggler and making his first televised match, Big E Langs with AJ Lee in the corner. Team Hell No. Absolutely love Team Hell No. Thought it was just so much. It was just fun. It was just fun and entertaining, wasn't it? I mean, looking back now, I honestly don't think Daniel Bryan would be in the position he is right now. It was not the team. Hell no. I mean, he got over in 2012, but I think just the fun stuff he did with team. Hell no. Got it. Made his popularity just grew and grew and grew. I mean, um, yeah, just ah. Oh. It all started with the whole anger management segments. Those were some of the best segments of the PG era, in my opinion. thought they were just so fun and so entertaining there. So, yeah, and they, so they, all started, they all started out hating each other with Dr. Shelby and all that. But then they eventually turned into friends. And it was, oh, it was just a fantastic journey. And like I say, helped Daniel Bryan's popularity grow. And reinvented Kane as well. I mean, Team with Daniel Bryan facing the Shield now was some of Kane's best in ring work of his whole career. I mean, Kane was one of those guys who, every time you think he's finished, every time you think he's done, he's got.
got nothing left in him. He always needs to reinvent himself. He's done it again now with the whole corporate cane thing. <clears throat> and Dolph Ziggler a year ago looked like he was ready to burst out and become a main event star. He had the money in the bank briefcase and he cashed in the next night in New Jersey to win the world heavyweight title in a very memorable raw moment. So future looked rosy for Dolph Ziggler a year ago. Obviously a lot can happen in wrestling in one year and Dolph Ziggler's lost so much momentum it's not even funny anymore. Big E Langston had come in from the NXT at the end of 2012. It was Dolph Ziggler's bodyguard type thing. Now the good role at first now. Big E Langston currently the Intercontinental Champion. Uh, WWE, it's obvious WWE has big plans with Big E. And I think he's got it inside him to make it. I mean he's pretty green now but you can definitely see improvement in him. I think you can see passion in him as well, so Biggie Langston definitely has a shot of making it in the long run. And this is a solid match. Just went over six six minutes, so it, obviously in that time you can only have a certain level of good match. And it was a solid match, but fast pace and all that. Um, I liked I liked this match. I didn't think it was a great match or anything, but definitely good and solid and all that. He had Brian and Ziggler carrying mostly action. Lanks Big E would come in and come in and do all this stuff, all these little things. Kane would do his thing as well. And Team Hell No wins this match to retain the tag team title. So in Daniel Bryan's second WrestleMania, he gets the victory. Now next up we got Fandango versus Chris Jericho. And this match just it was, I don't know. I just I wasn't happy about this match at the time. I mean at the time I said. If the, if the, if this match elevates Fandango in the long run, it's done well. But if it, if Jericho puts Fandango over, then do he lose his interest in Fandango a couple of months later? Then it would have been a waste of Jericho. And looking back, it was. I mean, Fandango came in doing the whole dancer gimmick, which is a pretty interesting gimmick. I mean, mu entrance music's awesome. And then he ended up in a because he was doing a feud where he wouldn't debut unless he. Um, Announce his name right, so he was supposed to debut a few times on television, but then it ended up they had actually having his debut match at WrestleMania against Chris Jericho, and yeah, yeah, just I wasn't that interested in this match at the time. Just didn't feel like this was a WrestleMania worthy match. Uh, would like to see Jericho do something else to be honest with you. Just, yeah, yeah. So we got a match, and the match is actually decent. Because Chris Jericho, Chris Jericho can have an average, at least an above average match with virtually everyone. So, for Jericho to have a bad match is very rare. Fandango is a decent wrestler. I always thought the You Can't Wrestle chance of Fandango in the build up this match was amongst the dumbest fan chance I think I've ever heard in my life. Because, how the fuck do they know that Fandango can't wrestle if he'd never seen him wrestle? And even though he had wrestled as Johnny Curtis. And he actually showed that he's a pretty decent wrestler. So the match wasn't bad, wasn't awesome or anything. It was decent. And then Fandango ends up beating Chris Jericho. And next night on Raw, that unbelievable crowd on the post WrestleMania Raw, Fandango was a mini sensation for a little while because let's be honest, that crowd was full of pissed, drunk European fans, <laughs> yeah, just being absolute morons and. The most memorable chant of the night was da 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 So drunk fans were humming Fandango's theme tune and then humming Fandango's theme tune and we had a little mini mini revolution for a little while. There was a little thing called Fandango and we people had put um videos like groups had put videos on YouTube of um. Fans coming doing the Fandango tune. Even um in the UK iTunes chart, the Fandango's theme song was like in the top twenty or something for a few weeks. That was awesome. And then like videos on YouTube, I would say of like English football grounds. Like at half time, they would play Fandango's music and that. And I was like, yeah, just do we really cut something that they could have really capitalised on and made Fandango into a cult star, but. And the Fandango was supposed to win the Intercontinental title at payback, but then he got a concussion and had to be replaced by Curtis Axel. And 
Fandango's never regained that momentum and I just don't know where Fandango's going to go from here to be honest with you. So next up we've got World Heavyweight title Alberto Del Rio versus Jack Swagger with Zeb Coulter and this was just did not feel like a world title match at all. I mean definitely over the last couple of years the world title had dropped in importance quite a bit quite a lot I mean is anyone on here watching this video? Did they honestly care about this match at the time? Put your hands up, put your comment in below if you actually give a shit about this match, match at the time and tell me why you cared. So, Del Rio turned babyface and won the World Heavyweight title. And I just don't think Alberto Del Rio's a babyface ever really clicked. I think he wrestles good as a babyface, but just the character's not that likable at all. And yeah, just. So they just don't make the character quite work as a baby face. Didn't get particularly over in that role. Did definitely far more effective as a heel. And fans real do really realise that because he him and Dolph Ziggler double turned a payback later that year. And I think Del, Del Rio actually had a when he was set with a heel runners world heavyweight champion in from uh, June October 2013. That was probably Alberto's best run of his career, I think. He was one of the best in-ring workers last year and Alberto De Rio is a guy that I think is just so underrated by the IWC, YWC. I mean, I think a lot of people think he's boring, but I just think the guy is just solid and good and talented. But unfortunately, he's been hammered recently by John Cena and the whole Batista feud has knocked him down a peg, so I can't really see him doing much more in his WWE run. Now, Jack Swagger was definitely not a world title worthy challenge at the time because if, throughout 2012 Jack Swagger had lost a lot of matches to everyone and he took some time off at the end of 2012 to he just disappeared from television then he came back won a couple of matches got Zeb Coulter as his manager doing the whole we the people thing the anti-immigration and stuff and all that and then Jack Swagger won the elimination chair to go number one contender, but I was like, after all these losses and he's just come back now, how is he supposed to accept Jack Swagger as a credible world title challenger? I mean, it's weird how, why did WWE, like, they knock guys down so far and then, out of the blue, give them a push and expect fans to accept it after they've lost all these matches. Now, Zeb Coulter is actually a veteran wrestler and manager, Dutch Mantel, which, how random was that Dutch Mantel coming back, coming to WWE last year? I mean, did anyone really see that coming at all? So, the whole we the people thing is Zeb Coulter talking shit about how America's letting all these illegal immigrants run the country and all that. And to be honest, I'm surprised it hasn't, hasn't, it hasn't got cheered for it because I know for a fact a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of people agree with the things that Zeb Coulter says about illegal immigrant workers coming and stealing American jobs. I mean, over in the, if he did this in the UK, he'd probably get cheered for this. Cause, but yeah, just I just didn't. I just it was all right. But he targeted Alberto Del Rio, which I understood the message Zeb was trying to say. But Alberto Del Rio is a bad example because Alberto Del Rio, although he was from Mexico, he was now a US citizen working in America and paying American taxes so he was actually he was not an illegal immigrant he was he had a proper work visa and all that and like I say he was paying income tax to American and all that so I think it was a bad example and the storyline just, uh, just this just felt like a mid card feud and that's what it was uh, I think I think Jack Swagger may have actually won the world heavyweight title but Right after he'd got his title shot, Jack Swagger had been caught speeding and got found to have some weed on him. So, Dudley couldn't possibly put the world title on him after that, but they'd built this world title match up so they couldn't exactly scrap the match, so they had to just have the match. And to be fair, as an in ring match, it's actually pretty good because both Swagger and Del Rio can both go in the ring, so I have no real complaints about the content of the match. I thought that the match was fine, it just didn't feel like a big time WrestleMania match at all. Felt more like a payback match, a Night of Champions match, something like that. But, but yeah, and Alberto Del Rio 
beats Jack Swagger with a submission to win to retain the World Heavyweight title, but and at this time I thought Dolph Ziggler might cash in Money in the Bank here, but WWE did it in front of that amazing crowd on Raw, which, to be fair, well done WWE, because that was actually the best time to do it, so we've got through the mid-card matches, now on to the three big matches of WrestleMania 29. First up, the streak is on the line, The Undertaker versus CM Punk, and the build-up, this actually, this did steal the show, but the build-up of this had a hell of a lot left to be desired, so CM Punk, as you know, had his epic WWE Championship reign in 2012, 438 days, uh, longest title reign in the modern era, all that, yada, 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 lost the championship to the Rock at the Royal Rumble. I mean, I think, I honestly, I'd wish CM Punk had main event this, but I, w I wanted a triple threat match main event, Cena, Rock, Punk. I think CM Punk deserved the main event, but but then, obviously, but do we really want to do Cena, Rock again? So CM Punk was without an opponent. So CM Punk was, so it's just nice uh, bone to throw after not putting the main event. He probably, possibly got the next big, and possibly even bigger than the title, to be honest with you. He was, uh, he got the match of The Undertaker, because obviously The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak is probably, for me, the most important match every year at WrestleMania now. I mean, uh, possibly not this year, because we have the prospect of Daniel Bryan winning the WWE Championship, which hopefully will happen, but we'll see. So, it's all started when um, CM Punk challenged The Undertaker to a match at WrestleMania. But the big show, Randy Orton and Sheamus all wanted it as well, so the match is booked on Raw for a match, Orton, Punk, Sheamus, big show. Winner faces the Undertaker at WrestleMania, CM so yeah, Punk won the match, so we're going to look forward to a great storyline of Punk and the Undertaker cutting promos on each other and all that. But then, what happened? But then, right after this, Paul Bear, the Undertaker's ex-manager, legendary manager, died at died at the age of 59. So Paul Bearer has died, so then apparently the creative team just scrapped whatever storyline they had planned for this and just decided to build the entire match around Punk taking the piss out of Paul Bearer's death, which uh, I don't, I didn't mind referencing Paul Bearer's death and all that, but to build the entire storyline around it was just in bad taste and just relying too much on cheap heat in my opinion. I just wasn't keen on it. I mean, Undertaker obviously wasn't offended by it because if the Undertaker wanted to nix it, he could have done if Undertaker wasn't, didn't like it. So it started off with um, Punk making snide little remarks about because Undertaker was going to do a tribute to Paul Bearer. Then Punk interrupted with that and said, I'm sorry for your loss at WrestleMania. Making snide comments about Paul Bearer and that. Uh, Punk ended up stealing the Undertaker's urn. Pissing up, uh, to be fair, Punk's, some, of, some of Punk's promos are so over the top that you couldn't help laughing at them. So it's him and Heyman have stole the urn for several weeks. Taker was, and he's pissing about with the urn and all that. But yeah, it just felt like, instead of giving us a Griffin storyline, a great build up, they just went with the cheap heat route instead. And that uh, didn't really do it for me. And all culminated on the last week where Paul Heyman dressed up as Paul Bearer, distracted the Undertaker. Uh, and, um, Paul CM Punk attacked the Undertaker because he was dressed up as a druid. They poured Paul Bear's ashes all over the Undertaker's like, "All right, all right, this isn't this isn't good." I mean, all I can say is if it was my dad who was dead and they were doing this, like apparently Paul Bear's sons were all okay for it at first, but then when this storyline happened, they were a bit uncomfortable how it turned out. So all I'm saying is. If it was my dad and they were doing stuff like this, I would not be comfortable with it at all. If yeah, it was, so, it was someone in my family this happened to, I'd be pretty offended by this storyline. So it wasn't awful, but I don't know. Just yeah, the whole Paul Bearer thing just didn't do much for me. But then we get the match. But I will say that this was the match I was looking forward to the most at WrestleMania, even though I wasn't massively looking forward to it. So. Then CM Punk comes out, being played at the ring by Living Colour. Where the hell did he find these guys from? I mean, Punk's song, The Cult of Personality, first came out in 1988. 
And I bet Living Colour hadn't performed in like more than a decade, probably longer. So I don't know how the hell WWE found these guys, but it was pretty cool seeing CM Punk getting played at the music, which is getting played by the Living Colour to his theme song. So that was a cool entrance. And Undertaker, of course, as always, great WrestleMania entrance, but I love the whole thing with the hand, with the picture of the hands look uh, reaching out to grab the Undertaker's great entrance. Then we get this match, and at the time I had massive question marks over this match because the Undertaker's 48 now. The last four WrestleMania matches you had, the two with Sean and two with Triple H, were really grueling, amazing matches. So my fear was because the Undertaker had set the city standard so high now that anything less than an awesome match in the Undertaker WrestleMania is probably considered a disappointment. And of course, he's getting up there for years. He's fought, he was 48 at the time. He'd only wrestled about no, uh, the two matches he had with Trip Late were the only two matches he had. He hadn't had any other matches. So, in over two years, he had two matches in two years. So, how could he really pull it off again? And I don't know how the fuck he did it, but he somehow pulled it off. Uh, Punk and The Undertaker had a show stealing match. The Undertaker was. As good as ever. I thought this was a great match. Crowd really into it, I thought. And I'm going to say now, that crowd was split. There was CM Punk chance throughout that match, and probably the most split I've ever seen a streak match. And I do wonder if Punk had ended the streak that night, would the fans have minded? I think some fans would have been okay if the streak ended on this night against CM Punk. What is What really, really irritated me about this match, and I was reading people's opinions they were com they finally complaining about the streak being oh the streak's boring the Undertaker's just gonna win again I'm sick of the Undertaker winning all the time but it wasn't that the last two years when he was facing Triple H was it just because it's your favourite CM Punk now you, st now you want to start criticising how boring the streak is just honestly I wish he'd just shut up and just enjoy the fucking match to be honest I hate the just, I wish people stop complaining about how supposedly boring the streak is. Just enjoy the fucking match. Because let's be honest, the streak match gets you all the time. They always, it's a great match. Um, CM Punk put on a great performance here as well. And the Undertaker kept up with him. Some great near falls. Punk looked very, very... Undertaker did a great job of making Punk look his equal before pinning him. I mean, it, it took him two two stones to get the win. I think the big spot of the match where Undertaker went for the last ride and Punk hit him with the urn. The, some of the crowd bit there as well for no. And, cause he did, and how I run the Undertaker kicked out. Then the Undertaker beat CM Punk with a second tombstone. And yeah, this was a fantastic match. The Undertaker does it again. He steps up on the big stage and how, yay. And what I thought I loved at the post match, which I thought was awesome, Undertaker got his urn back. And then for the first time I think ever that I've ever seen, I've ever seen the Undertaker with motion on his face. I don't think I've ever seen Undertaker look like he's about to cry when he did the nail down of Paul Bearer. In memory of Paul Bearer for the urn, I mean, that was pretty special for me. I actually see the Undertaker show emotion and all that. So, Streak is now 21 and 0 and counting. So, now to follow that, we've got a no holds barred match. Triple H versus Brock Lesnar in a rematch of SummerSlam 2012 and I was not keen on this match. I mean, the match is actually good, which I'll get into, but I was not keen on this match happening. I thought, yeah. When I knew they were going to do this, I thought, did, did, we, did we really get a rematch of SummerSlam? I mean, no doubt that SummerSlam match was good, but did it really warrant a rematch? Not really for me. Yeah. All started when Brock Lesnar returned to television. Because Brock Lesnar had beaten Triple H at SummerSlam, broke his arm for the second time. And this is what gets me about the IWC. People are going, when Triple H um, came out retirement for a retirement match. No, he didn't. We, well, I know I say we talking about after SummerSlam, but did Triple H actually say, I'm done, I'm retired? No, he didn't. He cut a table promo and hinted at retirement, but he didn't say he was retiring, so. I think people who complain about Triple A supposedly coming out retirement for a retirement match, they're just looking for any excuse to have a go at Triple H. 
I mean, I think that happens sometimes. I think people, a lot of people, and I know, I'll admit that I've done it at times as well. They pick and look at any little detail to have a go at Triple H with. Right. Brock returned to television in F5, Vince McMahon. For this brought out Triple H here. He wanted to revenge his father in law. Obviously, eventually, broke an arm. Then he challenged Brock Lesnar to a match at WrestleMania. I mean, before that, they had a great brawl where Triple H threw Lesnar in the ring post and Lesnar split his head wide open. So, Paul Heyman said the accepted but they're getting their stipulations Triple H said fine but Paul Heyman said he wouldn't tell Triple H the stipulations until he signed the contract and the stipulations were no holds barred and Triple H's career on the line if he lost yeah. so this is one of those ones where I wasn't quite sure who was going to win I did predict Triple H but I wasn't certain and if I was booking it I would actually would have had Triple H lose to be honest with you I think it would have been a good time for Triple H to retire. I mean, at this point, if WrestleMania 30 against Daniel Bryan is his last match, I wouldn't really care. I mean, if Triple H retired like next month, I wouldn't really be that bothered about it. Then we get the match, and if you ever, ever, ever said how sometimes a great crowd can make a match better, but a bad crowd can make the match worse, because for an, once again in a Triple H match at WrestleMania, the crowd were quiet once again. That's happened a couple of times at Triple H at WrestleMania. But only this time they were actually having a hard hitting entertainer match. But the crowd weren't really into it at all. And I think just the bad crowd atmosphere made this match seem a lot worse than it actually was. But I do think this was a good match. I thought it was the second best Triple H Lesnar match behind SummerSlam. But Overall, I think the Triple H Lesnar feud was just a good feud, not a great feud. The matches were just very good, but not great. I mean, uh, Lesnar's matches with Punk and Cena were far better than this. And I think we've seen better matches from Triple H over the years in this as well. So it was hard hitting, uh, entertaining enough match for me. Not bad at all. Both guys look strong, and Triple H avenges SummerSlam by beating Brock Lesnar and getting his win back and Triple H not retiring. This would culminate next month for Extreme Rules where Brock Lesnar beat Triple H in a steel cage match. So yeah, it's all these to twice in a lifetime for the WWE Championship John Cena vs The Rock now. As I, as I noted in the last video, I love the build up the WrestleMania 28, love the WrestleMania 28 match and it's tough. I know people are going to, I know the whole once in a lifetime, I know, I just, I think WWE mugged themselves off by doing that slogan, when they knew full well they were probably going to wrestle again, I think they even just said, like in the vein of Hogan Rocket WrestleMania, Icon versus Icon, um, Attitude Era versus PG Era, the old generation versus the new generation, if you had done that sort of build as well and just left it at that, I think they would have spared themselves a lot of criticism, but because they specifically said once in a lifetime and use it over and over and over in the marketing, that just set Dewey Dewey up for criticism. Of course, fans are going to complain about that, and rightfully so, in my opinion. So, so yeah, I think if they just done icon versus icon, generation versus generation, and left it at that, they would have spared themselves a lot of criticism. So, after. After Rock beat Cena at WrestleMania 28, next night in Raw, The Rock said that he had a dream. Uh, he had one more goal, and that was The Rock to be once again WWE Champion. Then The Rock disappeared to Hollywood. He showed up on the Raw 1000 show in July 2012 and announced that he'd um, uh, gotten a WWE Championship match at Raw Rumble 2013. And that ended up being against CM Punk, with The Rock winning the beating CM Punk to become the new WWE Champion. Meanwhile, John Cena won the 2013 Royal Rumble, which I understand a lot of fans complained about at the time, and so did, ah, I'm not going to lie. Just that whole thing is just so predictable. Then, although I love this, and the whole Cena Rock build, I just don't think the build of this one was very good for a couple of reasons. The main one is because the year before, they had the whole year build up, and I think in that time he'd earned, said everything they could say to each other, all that. Like, they, they used up all the material in 2011, 2012, so 
By the time we got 2013, there wasn't a whole lot left to say, say to each other. They were repeating a lot of the same things. Number two, this time, John C. and The Rock showed mutual respect for each other. I mean, I liked it a lot better when I thought that C. and The Rock didn't like each other. I mean, in the build-up of WrestleMania 28, you got the sense it was personal. This time it was about respect. And then the whole thing, uh, some of the things where John Cena talked about how WrestleMania 28 um, was a part of his collapse. It just wasn't believable. Because what was stupid when John Cena got beat off the rock? And then he beat Brock Lesnar the next pay-per-view. So I mean, looking back now, one of the big reasons that Cena beating Lesnar made no sense. Because if Cena had lost to Brock Lesnar, then he could rightfully claim that he was on a downward spiral and this would have made more sense. They'd made out like Cena had an awful year in 2012, but he'd made event every pay, every, nearly every pay per view. He'd never actually lost to CM Punk in a proper match. I mean, he never beat CM Punk, but the Big Show took the fall, Ryback took the fall. In the United Champions match, it was a draw, so. Who did Cena? Cena only actually way. He got beat of John Laurinaitis because the Big Show turned on him. He'd won money in the bank, but only lost that because of outside interference. So. Really, The Rock is the only wrestler who actually beat John Cena clean for this entire time. So, and then the whole, uh, the whole when you're talking shit, son, talk about how our time is now. That that made no sense to me because hadn't it wasn't it John Cena's time since 2005? Well, hadn't it been Cena's time for eight years now? And yet, and to add into, and also The Rock, 2013, I thought he was just pissing about, not really. Put, I mean, he showed some enthusiasm in 2011, 2012, but I just think we've got a different rock in, a different rock in 2012. I mean, his ring work wasn't that good. And dare I say, dare I say, it, some of the rock's promos in 2013 sucked. It just wasn't the same rock it had been before. You could clearly tell he was just taking it easy and pissing about. Uh, yeah. And I didn't sort of read the Rock the WWE Champion. Wasn't even not half the Raws in the build up to WrestleMania, so the whole build up this match just wasn't very good. I mean, I love WrestleMania 20 at the end. I was just not excited for this match at all. And I don't think many people were. I mean, I think we all knew how it was going to go down. So we get the match, and I will say I like this match, like, like this match a bit more than I did a year ago. I mean, when I watched it, I, I actually hated this match live. Thought this match was a pretty bad match live, but I've seen it a couple of times since then, and it's a bit better than I thought it was, but still not that good. I mean, it started out like okay, but then, uh, then it just got stupid. I mean, it was finisher after like a big finisher fest, like oh, it was like about two or three rock bottoms, about three AAs, STS. Just loads of kicking out of finishing it. Just took all the believability away from finishes. We got a couple of time when finishes were protected. I mean, back in the day, Stunner was rarely kicked out of. Tombstone, on, didn't, Tombstone didn't kick kicked out for eight years. People weren't kicking out pedigrees every week. That sort of thing. Switching music wasn't getting kicked out much. It was like when you used to play Smackdown and it comes to pain of Smackdown versus Raw. And you'd give yourself all your finisher icons straight away and just do your finishes one after another. And there's no real art or storytelling of that, really. Just, yeah, just got got too stupid and just not believable at all. After what seemed like a thousand eight years, seeing a beat the rock to become the new WWE champion. So I definitely think the match was disappointing. Could have been a whole lot better than it was. Like I say, the Rock's 2013 ring work just wasn't that good. So. Cena beats the Rock. Uh, as you as you think as you know what happened, the Rock and Cena embraced, made up, shook hands, and all that. Then Cena left the Rock into the ring where the Rock was telling the crowd that he loved them and all that. Which, to be fair, this this might actually end up being the Rock's last ever match. Obviously, he's not at this year's WrestleMania. He hasn't been seen on a WWE at all since then. So, the Rock may or may not come back. This might be his last match. So we got three WrestleMania's that revolved around Cena and Rock. And then at the end, we went up the ramp and then uh, Rock and Dawson Cena again, which actually got loud boos in the crowd. But people on the internet were whinging about it, saying it was one of the worst moments ever. But 
Did we not did we not expecting that? Like, I mean, it was fairly obvious that's what was going to go down. So, whatever. That closed out WrestleMania 29, which, despite the bad build-up and lack of interest, overall actually gave us a pretty decent wrestling show. I mean, we had Undertaker Punk was great. Dario Swagger solid. Shield match was solid. Triple H Lesnar was pretty good. But it just didn't feel like a massive WrestleMania, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think it was a bit of. A, I think a lot of the IWC weren't too hot on this show, but it wasn't quite as bad as people make out. So that's it. Now we've got through all the previous WrestleManias. I mean, it took me about five, six weeks to record all of this. So I'm not sure what I'll do after this. Probably the Thursday, Friday before WrestleMania 30. I might make an audio commentary preview on that WrestleMania. The day after WrestleMania, I'll probably be doing my typical slide review. And then after that, I've got... Because, um... Just don't tell anyone, but I've somehow got the WWE Network, so... What I'll, then I'll be um, posting a message on my channel. Uh, it's related to that, but I'll be... Because I've got all these pay-per-views now, I'll be doing requests for retro pay-per-view reviews, like slide reviews. But I'll get more of that at the time, so... I'm out for now, and... Um, I'll be back when I'm back, so peace. I hope you've enjoyed all these WrestleMania retrospectives, so if you've watched them all, I appreciate that very much, so I'll for now, peace.